Welcome back to season two of The Brewery Show, where we're bringing you to more breweries and more places than you ever expected. But we're here today in Long Island, New York, visiting Blue Point Brewery. Let's go inside and see what they're toasting up today. Uh, Mark Burford, I'm the uh, founder and brewmaster and uh, partner, owner, partner. Peter Cotter, and I'm a co-owner of the brewery. 1998, the brewery finally opened. I'd been working in breweries and my partner Peter had been working on the distribution side. And at that time there weren't any uh, craft breweries here on Long Island. There were a couple of restaurants that had come and gone. And we were both beer guys that traveled the world and really tasted a lot of good beer. The whole craft beer thing was still brand new on the East Coast. It seemed like the thing to do at the time, you know, there was no fresh beer around here on Long Island. We got to drink some great fresh beer around uh, this country as well as other places. And uh, every time we come back home, well, there's another stale beer we can drink, you know, so it kind of gets depressing after a while. So we decided to do it for our own pleasure, you know, and if somebody else wanted some, that'd be great. So it really just became time in our lives to do our own thing instead of uh, work with somebody else. The growing so fast, it's, you know, it's ridiculous. When I first got here, um, Brewing like once a week, it was kind of just me and a couple other entry level guys. I hired uh, my buddy Jim a year later. I was like, it's great, dude. The winter time is dead, we don't do anything. And, and sure enough, it had just picked up. We, we must have signed on. I think we, we kind of doubled our efforts in the city at that point or something. So all of a sudden, now we're brewing five days a week. He's like, what happened to the winter time? Now it's just absurd. We're brewing like nine brews a week in, in a five day period. And, um, just you know, crazy every day. I got guys come in at midnight to start. You know, and we kind of do two shifts on that, headed towards three shifts. It was pretty insane. We used to go to every bar, make the beer, and try to sell one keg at a time. We had a station wagon and a dog, golden retriever, and we'd go in and say, "Hey, we got this beer," and everybody would just say, "You're crazy! What the hell are you doing?" You know, look at us like we had three heads. And so it's just basically one step at a time. Give everybody a sample of the beer. Have them taste the beer side by side to some imports that weren't so fresh, and then. We went over accounts one at a time. And then I was uh, making a delivery because I was doing the deliveries for a couple of years. And so we're open about five months. And uh, I got an account to carry all our beers on tap. You know, I, I think that, yeah, this had three taps. And then the other place that I went to before that was about six taps. And the one place is sort of a, a hippie um, surfer place, which is no longer around. And then there's this high-end restaurant. So I had made the delivery first to the, to the surfer place, who had all our taps, about six of them and uh, made that first delivery on 4th of July weekend in the Hamptons, you know, and just loaded them up with beer. And uh, the guy took me out and back and showed me around, had a beer, and sort of experienced some of the things that you would do in a hippie bar like that. But the problem was I had to do this for business, right? You know, it was at that morning delivery. So when I left, I got in the van and said, okay, it's 4th of July, I need to make it out to East Hampton, and went to the next high-end place. And uh, my dog was hanging out the window, and I knew I had to clean the lines in this place when I delivered because it was freaking disgusting. And uh, so I'd clean them every time. I'd clean them, and i look, and there's people in there. You know, the place is packed with, I think it was Christy Brinkley sitting there, and, you know, there might have been a senator and this and that. And I went in, and I'm thinking, oh, my God, this is one high-end place. I started cleaning the lines, and somebody came up and said, what are you doing? How can you, you know, why are you doing this in the middle of lunchtime? And I was trying to really keep a low profile, and I don't know, I was getting, a, I was getting some flack, and... Uh, I'm thinking, is this the right move? Should I be doing this right now? And then suddenly I see my dog running through the restaurant. You know, he jumped out the window <laughs> of, the of the delivery truck and he's running through the restaurant. And like, you know, all the people are trying to pet him. There's waiters chasing him. I, I don't know, I guess to me it was just, a, I, I, everything kind of came to a head right there. I'm like, what the hell am I doing? I, you know, there was just, uh, it's been a very interesting ride for us, as you can imagine. Yeah. I was homebrewing for many years. I got a job at the homebrew shop because I was just obsessed with it and I would go in and the owner was like, it was a part-time thing for him. So I was doing that, I was leaving the beer distributor store, it's like a life around beer, you know, I was leaving the, that hasn't really changed. So I was working at the beer distributor, I'd leave there at three o'clock in the afternoon, I'd go open up the homebrew shop, do that until like seven o'clock at night, then go home and make a batch of beer because I now was getting cheap ingredients. So I would just make stuff, make stuff, make stuff, and then it came like months later, weeks later, it came time to bottle it, I'd be like, I don't feel like doing that, I'd just throw it out and stuff, you know, I was like, I just love making the beer. Yeah, I had beer to drink and I had beer for all my friends and stuff, but uh, so I was just brewing like crazy and then, you know, I, I, I decided, you know, that's kind of what I wanted to do for a living. There was some ad in, in the, uh, 
in a paper. And I remember seeing it, you know, make your own beer, five gallon batch, plastic bucket, and uh, pretty much that's how it happened. By the time we got done, and sometimes with the bathtub, and, you know, the Rottweiler lapping it up and all that kind of stuff, and you know, bottles popping all over the house, and well, you know, it was all good fun. Um, you know, my partner took it to a different level, he, and uh, and so uh, you know, he became a brewmaster. I, 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 I mean, I, I found out about fermentation. I mean, you can you can make beer out of dirty socks if you want. You know, just started sending letters out to breweries somewhat nearby. Um, hey, I'd love to. And these are letters I get every day now. I'd love to come in. I'd love to volunteer. I'd love to mop your floors. I'll do anything, and they think they will. Um, that's that's good. But uh, so I started sending letters out like that. Nothing really happened. People were nice to get back to me and say, oh, we don't have anything, this and that, and they'd suggest other things to do. Um, finally, I heard of a uh, brewery in Connecticut, which was about 45 minutes from where I lived in Norwalk, Connecticut, um, New England Brewing Company, who was looking for an assistant brewer. And it was, I heard it was a paid job for X amount of money, not, not a ton of money. And I, so I deleted the, I will volunteer my time off the letter. I put my resume together real quick, and I sent it in. Just kind of the right place, the right time. They were desperate. I got in doing just entry level stuff and, and lucky for me or them shortly thereafter they kind of saw that I knew what I was doing and I wasn't just a, a kid getting my foot in the door, I was and, and that was a great opportunity so I started moved along pretty quickly. I worked there for three and a half years. By the time I left I was a head brewer there. So um, that's how I got into it. From there I went to another brewery in uh, Boston, um, Harpoon Brewery. And then uh, from there I came back down here. Kind of wanted to get back to New York because then it's like pizza and sarcastic people. Yeah. I think we have our own unique style here. We certainly make plenty of hoppy beers here at Blue Point. We're sort of, I would say we're more West Coast centric than we are East, but I consider it a blend of all three. We started with the toasted lager. That's our flagship, and uh, that's something we came up with from the beginning, again, 13 years ago when we opened up on Long Island. It was uh, sort of a craft beer wasteland. A lot of people drinking bass ale, and we thought, well, if we come out, you know, who's our target audience? We need something that's just gonna be a little more flavorful for these folks, and, uh, and so the toasted lager was the, was the one. It was, uh, you know, I always thought of Anchor Steam as being a, a great model for us, and certainly the steam beer is something that we sort of modeled that beer after. Somehow it became the one that uh, people like the most. It's an amber lager uh, with a little bit more flavor to it, a little bit hop up front. It was a pale ale came next, and uh, that was uh, again strictly for personal reasons. Here, uh, we like that beer, still do. It's not going to go away. Very much a West Coast hoppy beer. And the IPA, the Hoptical Illusion, the Big Brother, the Pale Ale. Once again, it's a big hop, hop thing, and we try to step up as you go up the alcoholic ladder with the beers, five, six, seven, eight percent. And then we have the No Apologies, which is the, the Imperial IPA, which is three above at nine or ten percent, and you get a choice of anything you want in, in hops in that way. We were sort of on Long Island by ourselves for years and years, but the brewing community on a whole is a, a tremendous resource. Craft brewing is the first successful open source endeavor by humankind. And I really stand behind that line. I mean, everybody is really would share uh, whatever they can to help you out. In most industries, if you shared your best practices with another person, you'd get fired immediately and you know, they'd be looking for retribution. We've been on Facebook for a couple years now and you know, we're, we're getting, building up a pretty good following there. For us, what's been great is it's been able to sort of regionalize us from here in Patchogue, local, down all the way down to Key West in Florida. It gives us sort of a local presence, you know, all up, all up and down the eastern seaboard. I can go out and see somebody in the west coast and say, hey, how do you do that? And they'll give me an in-depth explanation of what took them years to figure out right off the top of their heads. Uh, there's two things we say in craft beer, you know, there are no secrets in beer once you taste one, and craft beer is 99% asshole free, and I don't want to be the other guy. Cask Ale Festival is one of the biggest, well definitely, you know, the biggest gathering of, of casks on the island. It certainly is uh, unconventional as in any business, invite all your competition in, and we love it. We welcome them in open arms. We used to do them in January in the snowstorms, and the first one we had a tremendous snowstorm inside the brewery, and we had all power outage, we had people coming on skis and snowshoes and four-wheel drives, and we had to get the candles out and the acoustic music, and it was a real fun time for everybody. And we were surprised at how dedicated people were to come visit us, even in a terrible snowstorm. 
And so we, we've done it ever since, and it's grown into 1,500 people in the tents in the parking lot with live music and lots of bending. Probably close to, if not over, 100 casts. And uh, so basically, you know, pretty much all the locals are in, and some other names from around the country, you know, Stones throwing a cast this way. Green Flash and all these breweries from out west, I mean, it's, uh, it's fantastic. I can't wait to drink them myself. You know, this is, the variety is incredible. It builds a big, strong community of more, you know, educated, if you will, and more savvy beer drinkers, so yeah. Put in a barrel room so there'll be barrel aged beers of all type. There'll be sour beers that are in those barrels as well. We were out west just last week there and went to Russian River and Lagunitas and just had all these awesome beers. Well, that's the direction we'd like to go um, and bring on some of the more high end lines, get a corking line without a doubt. Anything that comes along the pike that really interests us, it's hard to say exactly what. We've been sort of out of capacity for a while and so we. You have a lot of pent-up energies for new beers. I mean, if that stops, we might as well close the doors <laughs> right now. We have all kinds of plans to do all kinds of beers. There's such a wide range out there and so many new styles. Coming out. We just had a, a black IPA called BP Toxic Sludge. Boy, we lost our shirts on that one. You know, it was all for charity, so we weren't able to brew it anymore, uh, helping the birds down there in the south. But uh, certainly, we'd love to bring that style back. People ask you all these questions like, what's your exit strategy and succession plan and all these kind of things. And, Really, our, our plan is just to make beer tomorrow and we enjoy the lifestyle, enjoy what we're doing, so onward and upward. And just take things to the next level. You know, you couldn't work with better guys who are, are really, they just care about the beer. And, you know, at the end of the day, that's it's about the product and the quality. If anybody's out there and you run into me, I'll be happy to buy you a beer. Uh, personally, invite everybody down to the brewery for sampling. And other than that, enjoy the day. If you like your lagers toasted and your hops, optical, make sure you try some Blue Point Brewery. Thanks for watching The Brewery Show. Make sure you subscribe to us on youtube.com slash brewery show. Thanks for watching. Until next time.